Take one. Psalms chapter 149, verse 1. Hallelujah. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praises in the congregation of the faithful. Take two. Psalms chapter 149. Hallelujah. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praises in the congregation of the faithful. Let Israel rejoice in its maker. Let the children of Zion exult in their king. Let them praise his name and dance. With timbrel and lyre, let them chant his praises. For the Lord delights in his people. He adorns the lowly with victory. Let the faithful exult in glory. Let them shout for joy upon their couches. With pains to God in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands. To impose retribution upon the nations. Punishment upon the peoples. Binding their kings with shackles. Their nobles with chains of iron. Executing the doom decreed against them. This is the glory of all his faithful. Hallelujah. Psalms chapter 150. Hallelujah. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the sky. His stronghold. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his exceeding greatness. Praise him with blast of the horn. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dance. Praise him with lute and pipe. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let all that breathes praise the Lord. Hallelujah. These are the last two songs of the Hebrew Bible. Let the faithful exult in glory with pans to God in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to impose retribution upon the nations. Now, is this, is this perfecting the world? Is this, is this bringing nations to be friends with nations? Is this the Messianic era? What is God talking about with his last two Psalms that he had written? What is he talking about? Why isn't this the Messianic era in the last two Psalms? Why is it retribution? Why is the book of Isaiah filled with retribution against the nations of the, at least of the Middle East? Punishment upon the peoples. Now, this is a good example. Generally, when God says the peoples, he's talking about his chosen, the Jewish people. But here he clearly is talking about the nations because that's the sentence that leads into it. To impose retribution upon the nations, punishment upon the peoples. Okay, there's a situation where you say, okay, that's the peoples of the world. Binding their kings with shackles. Is this the kings? Is this the kings that are the witnesses of the Jewish people? Being the righteous servant of God in Isaiah 53. Is this the same kings? Those that are startled and silenced. Chapter 52, the, the description begins, 13, 14, and 15, kings silenced. And yet, according to Jews for Judaism, and Toby a singer of outreach Judaism, they're the witnesses of this great exaltation. You know, I'm not sure if that's true about outreach Judaism. I have to recheck it. I, I haven't read anything but verse 10 in a long time. I do have the entirety of that, Medrash. 
tens are enough for me. You have to understand, people, I'm a prophet of God. I'm a man in divine beings. We're talking about rabbis who come up with all this information that they teach of their own, primarily using the Talmud, men's interpretation, men's interpretation of the prophets from antiquity. This time to come, this Messianic age, primarily comes from the prophets. That's a section of the Tanakh. You have the writings, the prophets, um, and the Torah. Their nobles were chains of iron, executing the doom decreed upon them. Whose decree? Whose decree is that? I believe that's the God of Israel. That's who I think that is. I think he decreed that. I don't think it was the sages and rabbis of the Talmud. I don't think that was them. They decreed otherwise, have they not? Have they not? They decreed a world of perfection, a utopia. That apparently, according to Toby a Singer, this imperfect, imperfect world that God made, Clearly, God meant for it to end in utopia. Uh, no, it didn't. It is perfectly what he wants. And as a matter of fact, having been taken in vision to heaven and seeing and seeing the new earth being formed, Isaiah tells us, God, what are you doing? What is creation about? Making a new heaven and a new earth? Guess what? The new earth is going to be identical to this one. That's how perfect it is. Indeed, he's going to choose another chosen. So those of the Jewish people in heaven who are written into the scroll of remembrance who are in right standing with God and have not been dismissed as the rabbis have as of this very day, as of this very moment, dismissed. He's here. And I am his representation. It's got to have a Moses to bring a new covenant. This is the glory of the faithful. Those who understand God and his ways. Do not test him as you did at Massa. When you had seen his miracles, he tells the Israelites. But you have, but they have forgotten his ways. I believe they've been forgotten again. I don't think these rabbis out there teaching Isaiah 53 is the Jewish people, his righteous servant. The only time he ever uses that phrase, he does it. He still calls them the servant after that. How come they aren't the righteous? And what did they do? What did they do? Oh, that's right. They atoned for the nations. They atoned for the Gentiles. This perfection of a world is brought closer and closer in evolution. An evolution that hasn't moved a dime since Abram, the Hebrew. A prophet of God, God tells him what to say. Okay? words that come from me, these videos, these books that I have written for him as the prophet like Moses, that's his words. That's his interpretation of his book. In the mountain of evidence God has set before you using me is more than you have of any, any reason to think of that, he, that you would need that much. They didn't come out too good, but something like that. Yeah, I'm a prophet of God, but I still live the human experience. I'm still Keith Ellis McCarty. In other words, he'll have me make mistakes. And it's nothing that's going to hurt his purpose, of course. But for me to maintain and continue to feel like Keith, with him running the show, so to speak, with three persons in one man, 
he tells me, he's taught me, it's important that I, I'm, I still do the same things. I'm very forgiveful. Um, not overly intelligent. I mean, I was smart enough to become a lawyer, but I'm no intellect. You know, I read things and I go, what on earth is that, man? So I stuff like that all the time. The oral tradition and the oral law are necessary for an understanding of the teachings of God's servant Moses, whom God charged at Oreb with laws and rules for all Israel. You see this again, that same sentence, that part of it in Malachi 3. He said, this time, he says, be mindful. To God charged at Oreb with laws and rules for all Israel, that part. Such is how you keep and observe the Sabbath of Exodus, chapter 31, verse 16, must be determined in the oral tradition. Commentaries on the books of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible are opinions, and there were many disagreements among the sages and rabbis of antiquity that continues with the rabbis of the common era regarding the prophets and their books. The common era began with the Age of Enlightenment, about 1600 and continues today within the common era are ages the age of, of knowledge the age of medicine the age of science today the age of information and the internet the Messi messianic era apparently is just a new changes or stops the common era and now then we're going to be in the messianic era now, it sometimes says Messianic age, but primarily I see it as error. In any event, this is still the common error, and David's here. David is here. The man described in Isaiah 53 as the sages said he was, the leper scholar. A leper because he's familiar with disease. A scholar, he makes the many righteous by his knowledge knowledge given to him by God himself you don't want me to do this okay except this my guiding angel the angel of God's presence and God himself lead me through what they want me to read from the books that I wrote this is from the life of the righteous servant of Isaiah 53, which is my life, that God orchestrated to be sure I fit every verse. A life of pain, wounds, suffering, very familiar with disease, and crushed with disease. The sages and rabbis of antiquity and the rabbis through the Middle Ages to this modern age of Judaism believe God is going to change his creation that is perfect to be an imperfect creation. One that fits them. A world that becomes much more suitable to them in the Messianic era and then becoming heaven on earth in the world to come. Believing that the souls of the dead go to a realm of souls and eventually unite with their former resurrected bodies. I understand in religion you, you set beliefs and uh, you're not too concerned with the realities of the world, but that's not ever going to happen. There's not going to be resurrected bodies. We have too much knowledge to believe any of that can possibly be true. And, it, and to teach these things, what you're forgetting is the young people. They're very real. They grew up on the internet. They know about fake news. They know about people saying things that just can't be. And you wonder why your attendance goes down every year. Why it's harder and harder to draw them. Well, they see, that's my job. That's one of my tasks. As Elijah. Who is the prophet like Moses. Whose purpose is described in Isaiah 53. If there's anybody from the Hebrew Bible that is being mentioned, it's Elijah, and he returns in the day of the Lord. 
Why? Why has he been in heaven? Because he can talk to the angel of his presence. Who else can? The man, the angel alights upon in chapter 11 of Isaiah, of Isaiah. Because the angel of his presence is the Holy Spirit and he is a person. The scripture is clear on that. Resurrected bodies. There's no messianic here. There's no world to come. There's no there's no rabbi or sage that ever saw it. There's no prophet that ever saw it. It doesn't exist. There's only the time to come, described in Jeremiah 31 of the land blooming again, meaning the Jews have returned, Jerusalem rebuilt from the destruction by the Romans, the Jewish people shall never be uprooted or overthrown again, the completion of all of God's prophecies in the Hebrew Bible with the arrival of four men and two specific covenants, friendship, in the new covenant of Jeremiah 31, the return of God to dwell among his people, the Jews, the building of the third temple by a holy seed. The amendment to the first covenant includes an inclusion of sin forgiveness as was given to the Assyrian Babylonian exiles, which is all 13 tribes who returned, remnants thereof, which is clear in the scripture. You know, somebody comes up with a story, 10 tribes were lost. I don't know why, there's two things I've seen on that and God won't specifically tell me, but uh, which is not unusual. But I do know that uh, 10 tribes wanted David, but he went with the two tribes from Judah. The kingdom of Judah includes the lands of Benjamin because that's where Jerusalem is and that's where the kings rule from. And that somehow the ten and two and, and, and the northern kingdom was deported first. And most of those ten would have been the northern kingdom, but not all. Uh, three of them were east of the river Jordan. Anyway, they became a holy seed and built the second temple. God comes back. He knows there's no temple because it's covenant of friendship. says, I'll put my sanctuary amongst you. And at the same time, he makes them a holy, the Jewish people a holy seed to, uh, again today. They don't know it yet, but every Jew on the face of the planet is forgiven of their sins. And I'll tell you what is part of God's retribution and vindication against the Christians. He wants them to hear you say that, Jewish people. He wants that being said left and right. He's not here to perfect the nations. Do I need to read the psalm again? You cherry pick. You come up with this world based on saying, oh, plowshare, swords into plowshares. Okay, okay. That means all nations lay their arms down. Well, how about that just sounded real good to the people of antiquity? Because it's not going to happen. That doesn't happen in our world. War is a part of our world and that will never change. Period. You'd have to change mankind. And, and everybody in the world speak Hebrew, which is based on a bad interpretation by Rambam or a selective one because he wanted to say it and back it up with something that was close sounds a lot like Christians to me that's what the Messianic era is it's just cherry picking and what Rambam said What else, what else happens? Oh yes, it's the awesome, fearful day of the Lord when God has his vengeance on the Gentiles and God speaks to his prophet again. So no longer are there taunts to the nations. The Jews are never defeated again. God walks amongst them again as he walked amongst the tents of the Israelites 
with Moses. Spirit entered into Moses and God was in his spirit. Where Moses walked, God walked. Where I walk, God walks. Period. He's just doing everything over me. And he's just showing you these are my ways. I'm not coming down here and change the minds of every racist on this planet to love the Jew and speak Hebrew. I'm not going to change the minds of every Christian on this planet. I'm going to have my vindication on them. I'm not going to make them love the Jews. Why don't I just make the Jews sinless and incapable of committing sin? Why don't I just completely change humanity that's so imperfect according to Toby a singer and he doesn't have the ability to understand apparently that utopia doesn't work with human beings they'd all have to be changed too it doesn't work he's gone through this with me here's an easy way to look at it love and hate you can't love if you can't hate they're, they're based, they spring from the same source. Anger and happiness. You know, there's an offset to everything. And to have the human beings that we are, that he wants, he wants our personalities formed in this harsh world. He wants, that's what he wants of the Jewish people in particular. Heaven is for the Jews, it's a Jewish heaven. And it does include knowledge of, of Talmud. If you're a Talmud scholar, you're going to be a Talmud scholar in heaven. That's fine. Just be careful what you teach out there. You can't imagine. Of course, thanks to outreach Judaism and Jews for Judaism, I've been shunned and despised. They won't contact me. I find it hard to believe that they haven't heard that there is a man out there saying he's Moshe and not taking the time to look at all the materials, but completely ignoring it. I don't know that to be fact, but I know it's going to get there. Uh, eventually, somebody's going to do a call in. Of course, they won't put it on the air. It's not a live call in, as best I know. Doesn't appear to be. But again, I don't know that. You see, God doesn't tell me those kind of things. If I can't know it of my own, if it's not something in my human experience that I would learn of my own, then they don't tell me. I don't know what I'll have for dinner tonight. I have no self-will. I can't know anything, of course, if they don't let me know it. But we're, you know, I've been uh, confined to my home. Just like Ezekiel, go to your house. You're not going back out amongst the people. You're leaving society. The land today blooms again. Jerusalem has been rebuilt. See the time is coming. See the time is coming. These two things happen. These two things happen. God says, I'll make a new covenant with you. A covenant, huh? Where else do we have a covenant? That's right. Malachi 3. The angel of the covenant. But now if you're a Talmud, if you follow the Talmud so strictly, the problem is this. Here's how Rashi, Rashi, Rashi? Rashi interprets it. <laughs> the angel of the covenant. Commentary. The angel that avenges the revenge of the covenant. He doesn't tell you what the covenant is. He doesn't tell you why. Why there's a revenge of the uh, an avenge of the revenge. What's the revenge? <laughs> what revenge? I have no idea what he's talking about. None. God won't tell me. He says, I don't know either. Which means to me, it's so far out there, it's an absurdity. And this is what Judaism is based on today. Judaism of antiquity. God expects more of you. And he expects more of the shepherds. <clears throat> you know, and everything you see and read, it... Uh, I mean, as I understand it, the shepherds, if, the, if the, they are supposed to be like watchmen, and especially for Elijah, if you don't recognize Elijah, and then he can't, he can't uh, draw people to him, that's the main purpose of it, but draw people to him by uh, recounseling the families one to the other through Judaism, be mindful of God's laws given to most teachings at Oreb. 
of the laws and rules for all Israel. That's the other part of the amendment. Other than that, he keeps saying it. I'll be your God and you'll be my people. That's that's the first covenant. Do everything Moses said. And uh, then ask be mindful. That's for every individual or individual sect group, uh, conservatives, orthodox, orthodox, for them to decide to um, make a new oral tradition on it. What does it mean for us? What is mindful for us? I have my own ideas. He doesn't tell me. I mean, that's what I'm supposed to say. Okay, well, that's, so that means the new covenant between God and the Jewish people is here. How are the Jewish people to confirm this? Where is the information on the new covenant in the scripture? Answers in Malachi 3, 1. Behold, I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall come to his temple suddenly. As for the angel of the covenant that you desire, he is already coming. And that has to do with the test of devotion. It has to do with the covenant between God and myself. Offer yourself for guilt and emotion. Doesn't say he's going to lay it on me. He says, I'm going to lay, you, I'm going to lay my fire refinement on you. I'm going to change you. He says, I've already wounded you throughout your life. I'm going to change you with maltreatment, punishment, chastisement, crushing and bruising in my power until you where I want you to be. And if you agree to this, I might give you long life. It's not crucifixion on a cross. That's what it is. I said yes. I, I, I had been exposed to death. I was told I would be dead 20 years ago in a month or so. And I've never seen a doctor again. Became a triathlete running half Ironman triathlon. God said, just, you know, once you got the diagnosis, I removed it. Because I told him I never even had any real signs of it. I was so sick at the time from colon cancer and chemo, I couldn't even tell. I mean, I couldn't walk 10 feet without huffing and puffing. But I was just out of shape. He said, no, I took it away. It's just as soon as you got the diagnosis. And, you know, of course, my dad's 93, but he's sitting there right with me. They're showing me my lungs. They're showing me the white spots. My father's looking at me. And I said, well, what does all that mean? He says, it's untreatable. I said, what does that mean? He says, you're going to die. A face on my father I'll never forget. That's what I've been through to be this man. I mean, I, and, and I'm just like Moses. I'm just like Ezekiel. I have a furious spirit. God's been toning it down for 13 years now. And he can just utterly stop it in his power. It's like a pillow comes over my anger and it just disappears. Uh, embarrassment. Same thing. He's, for 13 years, he's drawn emotion from me every day. Over and over and over. Slowly, slowly coating me. Thin little bitty coats at a time. You know, you can imagine from my perspective, I'm like, why don't you just. Okay, picking back up. My camera stops. My memory card only holds half an hour. So <laughs> I can't even recall exactly what it was. But picking back up, the messenger, I know I was reading Malachi 3 1. The messenger is later found to be Elijah as the only man mentioned in Malachi 3. Verse 23 of Malachi 3. Lo, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the coming of the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. He shall will counsel parents with children and children with their parents, so that when I come, I do not strike the whole land with utter destruction. Lo, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the coming of the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. Why are you looking for Moshe? Why aren't you looking for Elijah? Oh, that's right. You don't have a description of him. Well, there used to be a description of David. That's what God calls the descendant of David, the twig of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse. 
How on earth are you not looking for that? And how on earth does that fit into a messianic era of God bringing, changing humanity, the minds of people with a set personality, racist, suddenly love the Jew? What does that do to them in their lives and, and their society and the people they hang out with? Oh, that's right. They all get changed too. What are they like? What is a racist like who suddenly loves the Jew? I'm just curious. In this perfect world, sounds like there's going to be some commotion out of that. I don't know. <laughs> the time to come of Jeremiah 31, that is here. It began in 1948. It didn't really start blooming for a while. The cities weren't restored for a while. And Jerusalem may have already been larger than it was in antiquity. I don't know, but there's no question it has been rebuilt larger than antiquity today. And that's the description in Jeremiah 31. It has biblical markers based on things outside of the gates that you just can't find today. But clearly it's bigger than that now. But why is it so difficult to see when this time is? You know, I hear, I hear all kinds of things from rabbis. God has me watch. You know, basically, is we, we all uh, the Jews for Judaism, Michael Scoback. We all have to stop sinning to the extent we can, because God understands we are human. It's not going to be perfect, but basically, we all need to stop sinning. No, you just had to return. This has been in the works for uh, well, 63 years with me. I'm born in 1957. The land was beginning to bloom again. The cities were being restored. Jerusalem was being added to, rebuilt, a metropolitan, beautiful city. It's all in the works. All you had to do was return. Because that's what Jeremiah, see a time is coming. And then you end up at Malachi, it's the day of the Lord. Do I need to read the Psalm again? Read 149. Day of the Lord is not the Messianic era, and yet David's here. He's his representative. He's also Elijah. That's one thing you don't have to worry about. And Ram Bam said, well, we don't know if Elijah comes before Moshiach or after Moshiach. We cannot concern ourselves because the prophets aren't very clear on this, which may very well be true. But not this prophet. This prophet's very clear on it. Because why? Because God's telling me. That's the difference in a prophet. Rabbis come up with this information on their own in large part, built on information from other rabbis, sages, Talmud, <clears throat> and things that happened after that, Rambam and Rashi with their interpretations. Not so me. No, I just say what he, and learn what he has me say and learn. He teaches me and he says, now go say this. It's a process that's been evolving for 13 years, but I'm born in 1957. And I asked him, why? Why, why me? That's what Moses said. Who am I? Who am I? Who's going to believe me? And in a sense, he's saying, why me? I, I'm not made for this. I wasn't made for this either. I lived a life of suffering, pain. I was felt completely alienated from any deity in the sky. That's how I would have said it had nothing to do with God, had nothing to do with religious people. And you don't have all this knowledge. Well, it's been taught to me by God. I don't have to use the talent as a basis for anything. I just have the scripture. And God had it all written, by the way. All of it. All of it is written. Everything. The writings, chronicles, everything. Somebody was instructed, get some parchment, Get a stencil, write this down. There are men and divine beings throughout the Hebrew Bible. It's not just the account with Jacob. It's how God communicates. And there, his very being, you know, our image in him. Let us make man our image. And he's talking to the Holy Spirit, the spirit that is hovering over the waters. On the first page of Genesis, first chapter. What is that image? 
we're, we're beings with emotions. He's a being with emotions, but they're not human emotions. There is differences. I don't ever think of him as a human being and this and that, and his purposes always come first. This is his creation. It's not Toby the Singer's creation. It's not the rabbis and sages of the town's creation. This is God's. This is God's. And if they find that through the scripture, it's because they want to find that through the scripture that there's some evolution into a perfect utopia because of things that are in prose and poetry and songs and at first with the people of antiquity. But now we, we've moved to the day of the Lord. Now we're at the end of the prophets. And none of that is happening. As I understand it, anti-Semitism's up. The world's still speaking their same languages, and there's plenty of racists in America, apparently. They still got a fence around the largest, one of the largest conservative synagogues in the world here in Houston, with a guard at the gate. Doesn't look like anybody's putting their swords down and turning them into plowshares. I know, that's, that's, they're supposed to, they're supposed to be looking for you and they're supposed to get everything, the benefit of the doubt and look at the proofs before me and they are not doing it, which is why in Isaiah 63, God, I was, a, God says, I was astounded of the peoples, none were there. Well, that's where we're at right now and he is astounded. I don't remember the name of the video. Just did a video before this one's going to be posted. It's the last video I posted. It's called Introduction uh, to Isaiah 53 in the Day of the Lord. It comes from that book. It's a streamlined ver uh, version of Isaiah 53. It's just a discussion of the verses without trying to fit anybody into it, without any commentary why. There's a little bit with Jesus, but by and large, there's nothing that tries to fit Jesus, Israel, or the leper scholar into it. It's just understand what the verses, understand the story. You start out with six verses of unrighteous people who are sick from it. They have guilt for not following God's laws. And the story is this man who is, you know, uh, who suffers and uh, is familiar with disease exposed to death becomes and rises to the crown the treetop crown of God's righteous servant well why? to go and help these people and God puts him through a fire refinement okay they say by his wounds we are healed well he's wounded that's me okay but it's just to teach me to be this prophet, which in and of itself will draw people and Jewish people back to synagogue to write Torah on their hearts, to say, I'm going to get busy. I've heard all about heaven now. I've heard it's a Jewish heaven, and the more I know of these things, talent included, the, the greater my experience will be. This is a day when God must have a visible representation like Moses. Moses delivered the first covenant, commanded and directed by God. I'm bringing the new covenant, commanded and directed by God. Where's the description? If you can't see it in me who fits every verse, because of your preconceived notion that it's the people Israel, because that's the teaching of Judaism this day, not that every rabbi believes that, but that doesn't mean every rabbi is not dismissed with the eye of God. Do not forget his ways. Do not forget how many people in the Exodus, the original, the original 600,000 plus and all their families. Don't forget how many of them entered. They got that. It comes right along, tested at Massa. Now this, this video I just referenced is God put a very concise statement together in the uh, the comments with the video, the written comments. It put basically everything I'm saying again. It's just 
uh, we're adding to it with this. It's very streamlined. Uh, it, it'll be helpful for Jewish people who want to tell their friends. This is what really happens. Hey, did you know the rabbis get dismissed and God has a reckoning with them and he's not happy with them? Really, why? Because of the Messianic era. Here's what's really going to happen. And it's happening right now. And I'm so excited is what you should hear and probably will. We've got another Moses. And he is going to put it on the Christian. Like no anti-missionary ever even dreamed of. How can I do that, Keith Ellis McCarty? Because he tells me what to do and say, who to, where to be, what people to meet. I mean, it's all in his hands. This, you know, I've been to hell and back again a thousand times in thirteen years. He can put a pain on you and anywhere in your body that you don't think you can last five minutes with bringing you to literally tears. And I'm not somebody to cry easily. Although I never actually cry. It feels like I want to. You don't think you can make it five minutes. Two weeks later, you're still thinking, I can't do this another five minutes. First thing he told me, your pain doesn't bother me. I'm changing you. I have a purpose. You may not think it's fair. You may not think it's right. But you made a covenant with me. But didn't you make a covenant with him, Jews? And uh, rabbis, aren't you supposed to be heeding him? I don't see anybody looking to check out my story. I haven't see, received one comment of any of any value from anybody. No questions, no nothing. But you test him. You're testing him greatly. You think he doesn't see you. You think you hear your name being talked of by somebody who claims to be the man of Isaiah 53 and you don't check it out I've been to the conservative synagogue here there's orthodox right by it's a whole community of the Jewish people religious Jew and my husband is one of the largest in the country you don't know any of them Say, so, well, why don't you sit down and talk with this fellow? Let's, let's find out more about this. Believe it or not, I'm a reasonable man, but uh, I am what God will have me be. But I, I, I know that everywhere we go, we're very friendly and kind, compassionate, humble, and meek to everybody. And it may not sound like it when we're talking about vindication and, and retribution against the Gentiles for how they treated the Jew and taking your book and telling you you can't read it. When it's they that can't read and comprehend at the same time, there's no question of that. You can't read Jesus into Isaiah 53. That'd be like saying, I have the attributes of Jesus. Well, that, that ain't it. I am the Antichrist. I'm anti everything he is. He's super intelligent, teaches synagogue at 12, apparently has a perfect body. I'm disfigured. I'm, I, I, I have had disease. Where, where is any of that about Jesus? Where was he accounted played? Smitten and afflicted by God. Oh, I've heard all their answers. I've seen their Bibles that, that start basically putting new words in. Uh, this word means this. His seed means uh, those that follow him to heaven or something like that. Instead of children, the common, the common way it's used. So how do the Jewish people know who he is? There is only one description of a man to be recognized, believed in, and heeded as God's prophet, invisible representation, God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. No man has ever come who fits all 12 description, uh, descriptive verses, including Jesus, certainly including Israel, until today. The day of the Lord. The land blooms again. Jerusalem is rebuilt. The new covenant is here. All Jews are forgiven of their sins. There's a new temple to be built. God says he will place it amongst his people in the covenant of friendship, which is here. God could use the voices of those who want to get back in right standing with him. That's what the dismissal is about. You're not in right standing. He needs voices. That's what the whole purpose and task of Elijah is about. It's not so much making each family righteous. 
It's bringing people to him. They recognize who he is. And now you know how to find him. He's described in Isaiah 53. And he is the prophet like Moses. Why? Because he delivers the new covenant. Elijah's been in heaven. He returns. What is that about? Figure to speech. It means he can talk to the angel. I talk to the angel. Angel says, here's the new covenant. Deliver it. Speak it. Put it on the video. Write it in a book. Lift it up to the housetops, but I gotta have the support of the Jewish people. I know, I know, there's an evolution going on into a perfected utopia. Moshiach comes and everything's great, and he's kind of, y'all make him sound like the second coming of Jesus. No, no. God has vindication and retribution on his mind. He needs what he likes to use a man with a furious spirit that he can control. That's what he likes to use. Now, I don't know about Isaiah. I don't see anything that says that, but he sure did write a lot of vindication when the Lord returns one day. Many, many chapters on that. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. I do have more. I have a lot more, as a matter of fact. Thank you for listening, and I hope everybody's learning from this. Thank you very much.